Welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Gabriel Axel and this is the second talk in the Decentralized OS Decentralized Consciousness series as a part of the Singularity Net um, channel. So this is the second talk uh, in the series that I'm giving. Um, Singularity Net has a bunch of other decentralized OS um, topics that you can check out. So hit subscribe if you're interested in following that. So this is the second talk. The first talk is titled The Evolutionary Origins of the Singularity, where we talked about a theory called causal biomimesis in which humans are basically, since the dawn of hominins or even earlier perhaps, since we've been using tools, we've been externalizing our mind, our cognition into the environment in the form of technological artifacts. And as we do this, we aggregate kind of an ecology of technology. And that has taken us from axes to calculators, to architecture, to rockets, to AI, et cetera. And here we are today, basically sitting in the sensorium of our own creations. Okay. So today I want to do a follow on to this in which we talk about what are the implications of this theory and what can we do about it at a personal level. We titled this talk, how to personally prepare for the singularity, because we normally talk a lot about in the community at large, in the singularitarian community and the tech community and so on and so forth. We talk a lot about how to prepare at a technological level and how to improve the technology, maybe even how to relate to each other differently um, to prepare for this. That being said, we seldom talk about how to prepare ourselves personally for the shifts that are coming, that are imminent as our minds and technology integrate more and more closely. So I want to read a passage to you. Uh, uh, an excerpt of something um, uh, that's being drafted by me here. So imagine you are in a scenario where you are about to integrate with a synthetic mind and you are eager to transcend the limitations of your meat body and jump into an alternative or alternate or hybrid body. The technology has arrived. You want nothing more than to get on with the futuristic dream you have been anticipating. However, you encounter an unfortunate surprise. Upon teleporting over to the other side, you find your mind fragmented, parts of your psyche scattered and lost in a new time space. Whoops. <laughs> you didn't properly train for it and didn't rehearse the plasticity of mind and body that you would undergo. And instead of being conscious of the transformations that would ensue during your transfiguration, you had no context and it just felt like a maelstrom of sharded consciousness. When you end up in the new body, you are not exactly you as before, but as if you had undergone an accidental brain injury or coma, you are still conscious, but functionality is significantly limited. And it's not like you can simply just go back to the previous state. This technology has just been released. And so while there's great excitement, there is much improvement to be done on the technology. Like a one-way trip to Mars, there is no return. So imagine that scenario in which we are arriving at this moment where we can try a new technology and it's really messing with our consciousness in a way that we're teleporting our mind or uploading our consciousness to the cloud or to a blockchain and so on and so forth uh, or what have you. And then you are not really prepared for the experience. Despite having been a big fan of singularitarian technologies, advanced technologies and so on and so forth. So. The idea of personally preparing for the singularity is about how to make yourself more prepared for this scenario. How can we increase the chances of success? And that's a great question to ask ourselves. How can we maximize the chances of success of our transition into the singularity? And um, we should prepare ourselves as well for the singularitarian transformations to be actually something gradual, not, not something that is 
necessarily all of a sudden, you know, as technology continues to accrue in our in our field and our, our society, there will be new transformations of awareness, much the same way that our awareness is changing as we um, adopt phones and gadgets and so on and so forth. So, so what I'm going to argue here is that we must first become as thoroughly as possible cognizant of the very constraints under which we operate as human beings, the constraints of our cognition, the constraints of our emotions, our body, our consciousness. These include the body, first person perspective, time, language, memory, narrative, intelligence, and coarse graining and various human cognitive faculties. So coarse graining basically means we simplify what we perceive to be reality around us so that it makes sense to our capacity, to our intelligence. Every creature on the face of the earth and the universe ostensibly is going to be coarse graining their perception of the totality of reality. And they're going to be doing so according to the constraints that they evolved to have according to their niche, their environment, their eco niche in which they evolved. Humans have the same. We've evolved in a three dimensional body in 3D or 4D time space. And we arguably for a large part of revolution had to actually worry about survival. And it's arguable that we are not super well adapted to the current uh, circumstances and even to the singularity. That being said, human beings have developed sort of mindware technologies, uh, so to speak, or mind hacking tricks that allow us to kind of change the scope of our attention, our intention, and mess with our experience, our phenomenological experience, our first person perspective. And so these things have been discovered to be trainable. They've been discovered to be trainable in various wisdom traditions, ranging from shamanism from ages ago to even today, certain traditions such as Taoism, Buddhism, and so on, have techniques and practices laden within them that actually work to transform consciousness in various ways. Now, we might think, especially in our post uh, scientific enlightenment era of, of human history that you know these things are mythic structures of consciousness that they don't have much value um i would argue that the cultural traditions in which these practices are done are basically like a um, a mental scaffolding that allow these practices to take place they are like extra layers that Kind of color the culture and really present in a beautiful way the 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 wondrous cultural displays of humanity that we can evolve in our mind with underneath all that there are techniques that are done such as meditation qigong breath work and so on and so forth that allow us to point our attention to different aspects of consciousness one can theoretically and i would argue practicably separate those even just temporarily, the actual techniques from the actual cultural and mythical layers to be able to feel what is the core technique underlying a uh, specific experience. And those techniques, I would argue, are largely replicable today because they leverage underlying human biology. I've described this in my, uh, my PhD thesis quite at length. Um, that basically we have certain mechanisms of what we call bodily self-consciousness or BSC. Bodily self-consciousness means the way that we process sensory inputs according to our body, how our different parts of our body process sensory input differently, sound, touch, and so on and so forth. And the, the bodily awareness has this, is basically a constant statistic telling consciousness that you are located here and now in this body. And so it interprets all of experience or consciousness to be from the perspective of the first person, right? So you interpret your consciousness, you interpret 
reality in a sense to be revolving around you in a sense so in in a way consciousness is quite centralized and uh, what we could say here is that we're trying to decentralize consciousness to do that you have to actually try to yoke and transform your awareness with certain techniques now as i mentioned to dive into this we must act in, and we can do it again in a secular fashion it does not need to don the uh, a spiritual look or a religious look these are things that intelligently with awareness can be set aside or adorned as embellishments of the underlying practice having said that we're we're interested in efficacy here and how to transform human awareness for the greater good so uh, briefly in relation to my last talk on the evolutionary origins of singularity since we are replicating ourselves and you may want to check out that previous talk in the series which we'll link to in the uh, in the description of this talk we are constantly externalizing reality according to our current understanding of ourselves. So the technology we create, the AI we create, the artifacts we create are geared around our current understanding of ourselves as well as the various uh, behavioral levers and motivations that exist in our culture and society to create those artifacts in the way that they are. Now, if there is a different way of seeing ourselves, it is probably not being very well represented in the artifacts around us. So how can we incorporate new ways of seeing ourselves so that we can construct AI that maybe is more beneficial to human evolution, societal evolution, ecological evolution and everything. To do that, we actually have to cultivate the qualities in ourselves that allow us to see beyond our typical constraints. So for that, it's required to do these different techniques. And once we have those realizations online, those insights online, we can have better conversations with engineers. We can improve arguably human intelligence, which then gets translated into artificial intelligence um, in different ways. So because the first thing available to us is our constraints, meaning our human experience, you know, we might ask, how do we get, how do we make these transformations? Where do I start? I don't want to really join a cult. I don't want to be a part of this kind of like yoga bourgeoisie community or whatever it is, uh, according to your preference. You just want to do these transformations. You want to experiment with your consciousness like a, like a, um, a home biohacker. So to work with your constraints, the reasons why we want to work with our constraints are because they are something with which we are already familiar. And that's a starting point. And that allows us to transform our perception of the present conditions and reality that we are immersed in and we can perceive. Thirdly, the body mind, you know, this integrated unit of awareness and this me body is a personal fractal of the greater whole of the larger reality. It is a microcosm and it thereby contains the seeds for realizing the latter, the, mac the macrocosm, the reality at large, okay? So we might think normally that our, our, um, our body and our personal mind are very limited in our views of the, the greater, of the greater reality, and that's certainly true and arguably true. Having said that, um, it's quite maintained, and I'm not the, definitely not the first one to say this, is that, um, is that we are a microcosm, that we have bits of all the elements so to speak that it takes to that we need to kind of piece together a model of the bigger picture and realize it and start tasting it okay so now the singulatarian transformations are expected to be in a sense somewhat like how the microcosm the human fractal transforms to realize the bigger picture of what's really going on and other ways of perceiving, other ways of knowing. So you could argue that the most advanced AGI or artificial general intelligence that can think, you know, that can operate with the general intelligence of a human being and well beyond it, that that AGI could be like an oracle that knows everything and is connected to everything in reality and can give us the best information to, to for us to be as efficient and as and have the greatest amount of well-being possible. That is kind of an analog or you know analogous to the totality of reality that we're not always capable of perceiving from our own point of view and so 
the singularity is in a sense us merging our personal mind and body with this bigger vista this bigger kind of mainframe uh, computational structure and we can prepare for that those transitions from the personal mind to this kind of mindplex of fuse human and, and AI minds um, we can prepare for that by learning to kind of hack our consciousness now. And I should say that this is more disciplined and sophisticated than simply popping a psychedelic and tripping out. Psychedelics are very, can be under the right circumstances for certain people, um, very useful eye openers. They're the first kind of the way that people pop and become aware of a, a bigger picture and it induces a big sensation of awe and rapture. Um, having said that, it is a um, not quite the same as being able to program and cultivate your endogenous awareness, right? Your embodied worldview every day at an everyday level, at a very mundane quotidian level, to be able to experience those vistas and to be able to integrate them with the right uh, intent, practices, and awareness. One can do it, and one doesn't need to become a um, a celibate, a monk, or any of these things, it simply requires you to change the way that you pay attention, at least for certain periods of the day. So, <clears throat> basically, one of the points of inspiration for this is nature. Now, we're not talking about a, any kind of regression from where we are in human evolution back to some sort of prehistoric, archaic, consciousness where we're using stone tools, but rather we're talking about understanding that nature is a complex evolution of millions and billions of years of time and experiments of physical matter. And where we are today with nature is basically a beautifully complex system of various complex relationships at an informational level. So what am I saying here? That nature, as it is in its kind of raw form, right, unadulterated by culture and human society and all that, is a treasury of complex relationships, of complexity, meaning a way of sensing, inform we can sense information in nature to inspire our consciousness. Now, that means letting yourself be inspired by nature and the relationship between your mind and nature at large, just intuitively as well as cognitively and emotionally, you can learn to be, make your perception more fine grained. So you can kind of start to dissolve the intense coarse graining, meaning the intense simplification we have to operate from an kind of ego perspective in everyday life and society. By connecting to nature, you can let yourself be inspired. So nature is in a sense a repository of information. It is also a repository of information for IoT, for na nature 2.0, for actually hooking plants and fungi and all these things up to actual uh, devices to read out information. Having said that, the human, human perception is able to also just plug into this without necessarily any technological add-ons. So, our perception is essentially a virtual reality of the underlying physical substrate. Our current understanding of the physical substrate is that it is simply the body, the organ, anatomy, and the brain. And it's just neurons and so on. And that's the current limit of our, of our, of our scientific understanding right now. And that's where we are in the year 2021. And that's what we know that physical matter is what we can detect with our current instruments and neurons and blood flow in the brain, et cetera, chemicals, neurotransmitters, so on and so forth. There is a lot more that is just beginning to be understood, such as magnetic fields, and it goes way beyond electromagnetic fields of the brain and the gut and so on. All these things have kind of fields that, in that influence our perception. Nature is constantly interacting with that, and so is everything around us, electronics and so on. So, in a sense, there is an intuitive perception, an unconscious perception of the complexity of nature in our 
in our awareness through our bodily self-consciousness that we need to to perceive it in a conscious way and be kind of inspired in a conscious way to prepare for the singularity we need to actually kind of point our attention to those mechanisms and understand what it is that they're doing so there is generally a rough progression of of these techniques that can be these non-ordinary consciousness techniques that can be applied and implemented at an everyday level just by practicing anywhere between 10 to 40 minutes a day in a kind of systematic way and it basically begins with linking attention and breath right because then at a very basic level you're regulating your nervous system so different kinds of breath work working with breath ratios the amount of time you inhale the amount of time you hold the amount of time you exhale the amount of time you retain your exhalation okay right seeing the four phases of the breath the transitions between them all of these have you know you can model them mathematically like sine waves how smooth how jagged they are and so on how they compare to the other phases of the breath all of that is constantly every day whether we realize it or not kind of like gravity is acting on us unconsciously these things are always affecting us and uh, one day they'll be um, they'll, they'll be measured with precision um, and and that's certainly something I'm personally interested in and be and we'll be able to kind of map that and and use you know biometrics to inform decision making AGI distributed ledger technologies and so on and so forth in a really in a really elegant and complex way for our well-being so regulating our breath and attention is one way another way that is perhaps one of the more interesting and surprising ones is regulating our emotion now emotion is normally seen as something that's kind of below the the um, <laughs> cognitive the neocortex of the brain right who are more rational thinking you know we see what emotions can do to people and behavior so we think well people acting irrationally is not good for society so what is there in emotions to cultivate well emotions are basically in the limbic system and that sits right between the cortex the neocortex up here and the uh the brain stem okay and it's kind of that middle place in between our actual experience of rationality and our experience of our basic drives which are much more unconscious that middle place of emotions in the brain at an anatomic level as well as experientially allows it to be a pretty good target for these techniques and these um targeting emotions is not normally something that is discussed in most traditions for certain reasons uh, one of those reasons is because in old traditions um, if they started to ha have someone transform their emotions in a very positive way so they can experience bliss and awe at a constant level at a on a constant basis uh, those students <laughs> may uh, rebel and form their own little private cult and it would break the power structures so usually um, regulating emotion is taught much later today at a secular level in science we're talk we only talk about emotion regulation in terms of um, improving certain phobias, um, PTSD, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, traumas, and things like that, which is extremely valuable. Um, that said, by targeting your emotion and amplifying experience, what you do at a physiological level is you are essentially consciously regulating your homeostasis, which keeps your perception at its normal, where it is normally for you. And it activates the neuroendocrine system to create and release hormones. So if you can hack your emotions in the right way, such as by cultivating increased confidence, increased relaxation, joy, connection, love, uh, perhaps, as well as bliss and awe and ecstasy, these things are going to basically release a different um, uh, hormonal cocktail in the body. And that is going to potentiate your hardware, right? Your nervous system or your, your wetware, your grayware <laughs> to, to process signals with greater capacitance. It's kind of like on an electrical wire. 
if it's this thin, right, and through normal perception, it's only going to be able to process a certain amount of reality. But if you can increase the capacitance, right, or the, or the gauge of that wire, then you can carry more signal through your nervous system. Hacking your emotions is one of the first things and easiest things you can do for that. Um, there is a wonderful technique um, uh, that was developed by Dr. Glenn Morris in his um, in his in his uh, system for kind of you know tuning the nervous system and experience and awakening kind of new energies in the body, so to speak, called the secret smile. And the secret smile is basically you're smiling and from the outside, no one knows why you're smiling. <clears throat> so it's kind of secret in that way. What you're doing is in a sense self-generating the emotional um, the emotional kind of uh, activation within yourself. What you do in the secret smile is simply take a memory from your life in which you've experienced some positive emotion like peace, confidence, love, etc. And you mimic it, bring yourself back there in all your senses as if you're going back there and allow yourself to gently smile, actually. You can actually do this right now. You can just close your eyes, think of a positive memory in which you experience relaxation, confidence, awe, wonderment, connection, joy, love, anything positive. Just pick one, whichever one comes to mind first. Don't spend too much time on that. And then recreate the experience in your mind and amplify the emotional valence of that experience so you're almost smiling, even lightly, could be kind of very gently if you're kind of around other people or you're not used to smiling. Or you can let it kind of glow in your entire face and kind of, you know, as if you're in a field of awe and wonderment. And then gradually you let go of the memory and you're left with just the ability to, on a moment's notice, activate this emotion. Now, that's going to send a certain kind of hormonal cocktail through your system. And <clears throat> that is going to allow you to process information slightly differently. So if you're curious about that, I, I, I teach that and I, you know, talk more about that. You'll see the links in the description and in, in my kind of my, my learning um, uh, offerings and so on. So by getting in kind of emotion amplification and then attention and breath energy, um, you can start to increase the capacitance of yourself to perceive more than what you're normally used to. This then allows you to kind of shift your normal mental homeostasis, the kind of the virtual reality that your brain creates in your experience, as your experience, and you'll start to see that things feel different. That's when you start to realize that your experience and your underlying hardware are linked, not just in ways that you know is known conventionally, but you can actually play with it. Some people will call this a placebo effect. Sure, the placebo effect is something that's not well understood. It could be hacked. It's basically more like a, a the meaning effect. Right. You can you can generate a basically a, a virtual a virtual meaning for yourself. And if it allows you to regulate yourself better and that doesn't endanger if it doesn't endanger other people or yourself, then you know more power to you. So once you do the breath, attention, the emotion amplification, then you can from there go to <clears throat> focusing on specific areas of your body. So when you get into specific areas of your body, you can focus on how that part of the body and the glands in that area, what that feels like from inside yourself. So you have to take your attention, go down like a little elevator shaft in your mind, and imagine like you're perceiving from those areas. You can try your, your head, your throat, your, your, your thoracic area, then your gut <laughs> and your legs, your, your pelvis, your legs, your, your knees, your calves, your feet, and so on, and even below. <laughs> and even above that, you can kind of place your awareness there and imagine what it would feel like to look out from those places. When you couple that with breath, energy, and the emotion amplification, you start to perceive things differently and new capacities open up. Okay. So <clears throat> there are a lot of, a lot more of these techniques. Okay, that um, that that I am not even talking about. However, those are kind of a very basic way and quite advanced way, in a sense, because of generating uh, non ordinary consciousness in a stable way with practice. Currently, what's done out there is um, focus on mindfulness, and I, I refer to those as 
first wave approaches to mind body uh, non ordinary consciousness generation um, basically um, the first wave is about kind of like just calming your mind and being aware of what's happening very useful um, that being said it doesn't harness really the power of your attention and your intention you know to actually change perception because your perception works on a loop you're constantly perceiving what you and basically are um, what you're homeostatically you know you're used to perceiving all the time so you're you're predicting what you're gonna see based upon what you've seen in the past so you're creating already like a very subtle subconscious virtual reality for yourself right that then feeds back at you and you kind of live in a closed bubble already that's how we are that's how the brain works it's called it's called predictive processing or the free energy principle and we can talk more about that um, in, in a future decentralized consciousness conversation so <clears throat> there are other techniques though one of them is called uh, that feeds off of the previous ones I've discussed already is um, realizing the interdependent aggregate nature of reality <laughs> I'll say that again the interdependent aggregate nature of reality that means that things are not cut into little coarse grains and little bubbles like of cause and effect very linear out there and inside our awareness in fact it's much more complex than that everything breaks down atoms to molecules quarks and so on and it gets much bigger you know the effect of the planets on on the earth and the sun on the earth and magnetic fields and how that affects our awareness and culture and so on and then the bigger movements of the universe and the dark matter and all that you know, there are bigger scales we're living in a hugely complex system contemplating the aggregates the meaning the different components and subcomponents of everything in your own awareness first and then outside of you <laughs> is outside of your microcosm your body mind is going to lead to more complex cognition and that means that if you happen and let's say in the future when you're kind of transforming or uploading your mind and so on and so forth into advanced technologies and the kids are your grandkids <laughs> so listen up <laughs> those transitions will be made easier if your awareness can be in multiple places at once or at the very least if you can be aware of the sub aggregates and kind of simulate what it's like to be aware from those aggregates this practice is called Maha Mudra, M A H A M U D R A. And Maha Mudra is essentially a, uh, a cultivating awareness of the interdependent aggregates, nature of reality. You know, the atoms inside the molecules and the, you know, the molecules inside the tissues, the tissues inside the organs, and so on and so forth. Russian dolls outward forever, Russian dolls forever inward, all the way up, all the way down. And so this is a uh, technique that allows you to spread awareness more in different parts of awareness or in, spread consciousness inside different aspects of reality. Also, it pays well to simulate what it would feel like to be aware of another complex system out there, such as what would it be like to be looking out from the perspective of the sun or the moon or a robot you know what is the perspective of these things and if you can really cultivate the other basic things like your autonomic nervous system your your hormonal activation then uh, through the emotion cultivation and amplification it's going to be far easier to allow yourself to ask those what if questions or what would it feel like questions and hypothetically put yourself in another perspective another vantage point and see yourself from the perspective of other people, other animals, other parts of the ecosystem, other parts of um, a technological artifacts and other parts of you know, uh, the universe, <laughs> potentially, at least simulating them. Because that will, re even if it's just a moment flash of, of simulating what would it feel like, just 1% of the truth of that, you will then shape your awareness and your ex awareness will expand. And you'll be that much more aware of the macro picture when you're integrating with bigger parts of reality technologically 
So the kind of the, the point is to cultivate your fusion and transformation from your personal microcosm to the macro, the bigger reality that is not easy to perceive as it is because of the filters on our awareness to practice that so that when we actually undergo transitions with technology, regardless of our past preparation, we are more uh, ready for that, right? So it behooves us to actually practice these things now. Now, these practices go much further. I, I you know, this talk is not so much the, the, the perfect place to, to go super deep into these. I describe them at a superficial level to actually go into them and practice them. It's, it's worth it to spend some more time and discuss them and to actually go through them. I'll give you a couple more examples of, of, you know, of techniques that are available. So you have the circulation, gathering, and projection of, of breath energy, okay? You have emotion amplification, right? We discussed that to kind of simulate past experiences and just be left with the emotion, remove the training wheels, and then activate a perspective or an emotion based upon, you know, moments notice or command, a split second command taking the different aspects of perception of the nerve plexuses of your body the neuroendocrine regions of your body and viewing the world through those okay so it's kind of like alchemy almost like playing with your your uh, neurochemical alchemy as it were you're mixing and playing with things so you understand intuitively perceptually how these things work i mentioned mahamudra which is essentially cutting through the coarse graining of human limitations and intelligence to see things in a more fine-grained way and splitting things into different pieces and then putting them back together and seeing how they all fit. That, you know, for example, the oxygen you're breathing right now, noticing the different molecules and kind of imagining them going through your lungs, knowing that you know your body, your your, your cells reform every seven years or 10 years of, for different tissues in your body. So you're not really the same person you were seven or 10 years ago. You can take all this and merge it with a partner. So yes, that means dual cultivation uh, in partnership, loving partnership, whether it's emotional um, or whether it's actual physical union with a partner and you can share and amplify these experiences further. You can explode and dissolve your local consciousness you can do illusory body practices, meaning kind of like seeing what emerges from your unconscious if you relax awareness and have low lighting conditions, looking into a mirror and seeing what emerges. And those things that come from the unconscious and reveal a lot about your emotional makeup and so on and so forth. So then you can take all the elements that you've been playing with and kind of dissolve them into basically just greater and greater emptiness. That doesn't mean dissociate from these things. It simply means being aware that at the very center of all of this is really non-locality and not just thinking this, right, but actually realizing it. And it's a progressive realization. You, if, even if you have a one-time flash experience, then there's a process of integrating it. Question, how do you amplify them with a partner? <laughs> well, those are, first learn to amplify them within yourself and then start to play with you know, doing it with your partner. You can circulate breath and emotion energy between you by creating kind of like little virtual circuits from the top of your head to their top of their head and so on and so forth. Um, and it's best done when they are uh, aware. You, you don't want a power differential there. So you know, do it with loving consent and connection with the person's humanity, not treating them like an object, of course, that goes without saying, and yet it's worth saying. Um, and so you can do various things then the actual physical connection you know the the coital connection with the person um those are more advanced techniques and i think that those are those are things that i like to share um in the context of my offerings and my courses just because of the nature of what they are um and it's important for me to dialogue with the uh, with the person individually understand where they're at so i can know what 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 makes sense for them to practice in that moment and, and what comes after that so um, <laughs> so <clears throat> then there's more you can take you can play with your consciousness you can kind of project it into different points I kind of said that already with the viewing 
you know, the perspective of the sun from the moon. These things sound kind of silly, like kids playing with blocks. That said, they are quite profound, actually, because they do really shift the way you see the, uh, the universe. Someone says intention, intention, intention. Yes. <laughs> Someone says, where can we get the course? Yeah, there's a link in the description or just go to my website, GabrielAxel.com and write to me. So intention, intention, intention. Yes, yes, yes. In a future talk in the series, we will go over the exact mechanisms by which perception works, how it gets trapped and how we can break that open. And the main component of that is intention. Everything we do has an intention. Everything we do has a, a, a context in which it sits. And those are revealed by very subtle behavioral cues, you know, or more um, more explicit things, right? So when you walk into a temple, different than if you did when you walk into a concert. And th that's a subtle intentional field of the people around you and what we're all, what everyone is there for. So, and then there's things beyond that. Um, void traveling. Okay, this is quite exciting, for, I think, for people that are more mental and cerebral, which is probably most people in the singularitarian audience, in the tech-oriented audience, is traveling in the void, um, you know, understanding how dreams work, how to actually create dream settings intentionally, whether that's lucid dreaming or just a pre-dream intention and work. Um, all, all those things are, are, are things that, you know, it's possible for us to get more into, um, you know, if we do have something more formal going on. So shifting, entering, and integrating the void. Um, arguably, the traditions that existed in kind of prehistoric times um, or early history, such as uh, Australia, uh, Aboriginal Australians, um, their connection with nature um, was quite profound and they were quite connected with the, uh, the void. Um, you know, they had certain things where they would hit sticks uh, in a song and each each stick hitting would be a connection to their ancestors or something like that, right? So it's a related phenomena. I'm giving an example. People normally think, well, we can look at the, the advancement of someone's consciousness just by looking at their technology. Not necessarily so. They had more use of their, of the void perhaps, sans technology than we do. We kind of more rely more on the physical because our physical world is so complex and we're so you know, angular and specific in our rational cognition. But that's been developed over time. You know, We are literally standing on the shoulders of the past generation's technology that has been built. I would argue that we are more similar to, um, to an, an aboriginal or indigenous person living in the jungle or in the desert than uh, than, uh, or that, you know, in, in a more ancient times or even some places in the world today, we're more similar than we, than we give credit. Um, they are simply taking their mind and immersing it in their environment and making sense of it, right? They still have the same loops running of cognition and awareness and emotion and embodiment, but the loops run through different things, right? The information of the plants, the information of, of everything, right? So <clears throat> all these things give meaning to the human experience. And in, 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 in a sense, you can, ar you can argue against or for that all day long. And that, that's an endless, endless debate, uh, frankly. So rather than go through all of that uh, right now, <laughs> it's, I think it's more useful to say that humans, because of our limitations, including these limitations or these constraints, that will be present when we interface with, you know, more advanced technologies. These constraints must be worked with. They must be acknowledged. They must be sort of understood and given and allowed their, their natural meaning to take course, right? We don't try to escape the body. We actually try to realize the body. Yeah. So <clears throat> there are some questions and I think we have uh, some time for questions and maybe Maybe we'll even have time for a, kind of a mini, um, a mini meditation or so, of sorts. Um, someone asked about lucid dreaming. So, <laughs> um, yeah, so lucid dreaming. A lot of people try to go straight to lucid dreaming. Um, lucid dreaming is, is a, you know, there's various ways to get into it. There's tech that kind of wakes you up when you're sleeping using certain lights and all that. Um, if you're lucky, you and, and you know, make a really strong set of intentions to 
aware of when you're dreaming. Progr eventually, gradually, you'll become more and more aware. However, you don't have to be perfectly lucid if, to consider something lucid dreaming. Um, it's kind of like a, like a, a gradual spectrum, a, gr a gradual scale. So you can be aware of your dreams and why you're dreaming to some degree. You can be kind of conscious and reflecting. You can be aware that you're dreaming, but not exactly control it. Right? So there's an obs the obsession with controlling the actual dream content is um, <laughs> it's kind of a you know it's very fascinating. It's just a little bit um, it, it, you're kind of overshooting with that idea, right? To to do some thrill seeking. Uh, oh, let me intend myself to fly and do some crazy thing. Um, all very fun, of course. Uh, you know, it's very plausible. <laughs> I've done plenty of that. I know people who've done plenty of it. Um, and yet, you can go earlier. Just become aware of when you're dreaming. And to do that, <laughs> the secret sauce there, you have to do it while you're awake. View reality around you as if it is a dream. And I don't mean dissociate from reality. I mean simply just become aware. So start looking at your experience. Find the witness in the back of your kind of awareness looking at everything so right now i'm giving this talk i could be just in myself and kind of aware of my my mental and my kind of emotional embodied experience my breath i can also look at myself having that experience and then i can look at myself having that experience of looking and i could go back and back and back the idea is just to be aware and see if you can do that not only when you're awake that's the first part but then also when you're transitioning to going to sleep there's also another technique um, that uh, that well, I, you know, I teach it in full in, in one of my courses. So out of respect for people who have actually you know um, engaged in that and invested in that, I won't give it all away now. The the whole idea is that before you sleep, you undergo a kind of self uh, preparation visualization that prepares you kind of pseudo hypnotically in a way to to as a pretext or as a as a as a, a preface, let's say, to your dream. Okay, and that. Uh, gives you a lot of the benefits of dreaming. It's kind of like dreaming awake a little bit. Of course, in a safe setting where you're sitting, eyes closed, you know, you're not driving in traffic and so on. Um, someone asked earlier, can we automate, um, uh, you know, non-dual awareness? <laughs> um, I think for for that to be useful, one has to um, cultivate it themselves, and that's part of what I'm arguing here, what I'm making a case for, is you need to have tasted something, right, to kind of know what you're even looking for. Um, imagine if someone kind of just hit you on the side of the head, you didn't, and got you into non-dual awareness, and that was the, the automation process. I know that's not what you mean, um, but you want to actually experience what it is like to, to get into that yourself. And non-dual awareness, uh, j just okay, j just to make a, a, a kind of a, a point here, and I say this with all the with all the um, respect and compassion in the world. Um, ninety, like ninety percent of spirituality. No, let, let's be generous. Eighty-five percent of everything that you find out there is like garbage, basically. Um, people talking about non-duality, like it's not, and it's not actually that. Um, um, I, and I don't mean that as a diss to the people that are that are really making sincere efforts because I applaud them to be even seeking is a beautiful thing. So it's not a judgment call. It's more of a of, of an acknowledgement of the fact that you know we live in in a commercial society. We live in in a in a marketplace um, of ideas, and we live in a marketplace of goods. And spirituality has been commoditized, and and that's just the reality. And you have to look out there um, as to you know you have to have your intentions set at a certain point to you know to know what you're looking for or to know what you want to feel like when you when you arrive at where um, to know what you want to feel like when you encounter the thing that you're looking for the right you know instruction the right course the right thing to kind of go with your gut a little bit as well as use your your mind to kind of feel it out and see it so um, keep that in mind. So, so a lot of what you hear out there is being termed certain things like non-duality and all that stuff um, is not actually what that is. Okay. So, and I'd argue that it's much better to do some breath cultivation, emotional activation, to allow your mind and your body to be potentiated and to have the 
capacitance to actually process those deeper experiences and then go into naturally falling into mindful awareness naturally going into you know com contemplative states and then into non-dual awareness so you per perfect your practice and your practice will perfect you and step by step so when 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 monks used to um go into um meditation these monks were like lifting bags of rice okay like throughout the day and they were physicalized today when we have uh we're telling people to meditate we're telling people that have been sitting all day or standing doing nothing uh you know using their mind and in an intellectual job and a computer uh sedentary people right most of us in society um we're asking those people to sit keep sitting and meditating so when they sit they're just going to be basically in the um be encountering the momentum of their mind that they've been you know stirring the entire day so it's going to take that person a lot longer to actually achieve mindful awareness i would argue i would i would i would promote um based on what i've experienced what um my friends have experienced what many of my students have experienced is to first amplify the capacities of the body and let that naturally bring you to stillness or do that first and then sit in stillness and you will feel a lot more and you will get a lot more out of it and <laughs> you could be sitting on a meditation mat for 25 years and not accomplish that much um frankly so although i know plenty of people who have and that's amazing so there's different approaches so <clears throat> hopefully one day we can um uh and it's kind of in the works, I should say, to to actually bring this and merge this with artificial general intelligence, and to to kind of bring this into distributed ledger technology and so on and so forth with biometrics. So, um, <clears throat> I know there are some more questions. Um, I'm going to, and I'll, I can take more. I just want to do like a very brief meditation, right? And I hesitate to even call it a meditation. It's more of like a moment. Um, of, of, of awareness and a different kind of awareness. Okay. So I can't see the faces of those on your shirt. Somebody asked, well, there's a bunch of Greek philosophers as a uh, Heraclitus, um, Aristotle, Plato, and one other one. I can't quite remember who it is. Oh yeah. Pythagoras, uh, Her Heraclitus, um, Pythagoras, Aristotle, and Plato <laughs> sort of a rat pack. <laughs> not together in time, but, you know, across time. So I invite everyone to just momentarily close their eyes. Sit comfortably straight, right? Not over straight, just comfortably straight, relaxed, You're not straining. Breathe deeply into the belly. Feel the breath going in and out. So take your awareness that's in your head, right? You're kind of aware, looking out through your eyes, behind your eyelids, right? That's like the center of your awareness. Drop that as if it's going down an elevator shaft from the center of your brain to the center of your chest. And then pull that back, allow it to recede, awareness to recede backwards towards the back of your chest, like the back of the general heart plexus area. And look out at your body and at your awareness, at your consciousness from this area, the back of the heart. And intend that you are connected to your deepest wisdom, whether you want to call it your wisdom, your, your higher self, your soul, whatever works for you. And now look out at the world from this area, from the back of the heart, as if you are sinking to the bottom of a pool and you're looking up from the bottom of the pool through the water at the light at the diffuse light. And 
notice what the world feels like from this perspective. Imagine that you know you're connected to these this area of your body which has to do with kind of you know you have the, the physical heart, you have the area of your body that embraces things, embraces others, catches the wind with your hands, with your arms, the thymus gland which has to do with immune response, oxytocin, right connection. Look out at the world from that area as if you're kind of like embracing or connected with the world. You can pick a part of the world that you're, you know, comfortable with, just embracing a vista in nature. Notice what that feels like, just observe. Enjoy that moment. And now shift your looking glass, your perspective to looking out of the world from your pelvic region. Look out at the world from your pelvic region. It could be the pelvic floor, could be the pubic bone area, just the general pelvis, whichever area in the pelvis feels just immediately natural to you. And notice the kinds of feelings and sensations that arise in awareness. The kinds of maybe thoughts, emotions that arise here. Notice what the world looks like and feels like from this perspective. Right? It's kind of like your senses are viewing the world from that area. Observing, kind of taking very gentle note. Of what you sense and observe. And now return to viewing the world from your heart area. The thoracic area of the chest. And notice the difference. Notice the difference. Another little trick. The things that you noticed from your pelvic region, the unique things that you notice from that perspective, look at those same things, more or less, through the perspective, from the perspective of your chest and your heart region. Notice if they feel different when you look at the same things in the world or feel the same things in the world from the perspective of your heart region. And then relax and sink back again towards the back of the heart, almost like the very, you're receding gently down to the bottom of the pool, looking out at the world. You can even look at your whole body now if you want from that perspective, from the back of the heart. Look at your entire awareness, your entire experience. Take a deep breath. And then open your eyes when you're ready. So you may have noticed that the kinds of things you see and the kind of way it is perceived changes depending on where in the body you're looking from. And that's no trick, it's no coincidence. It is simply that 
our perception <laughs> is not just happening through our eyes over here, right? I mean, that's what we see, this is what we hear. Sure, those are just the sensory perspectives. But there is a dream logic, a dream consciousness that is constantly happening, like an ocean in our psyche. That is made up of many different factors and can be looked at from many different perspectives. And you will perceive differently. So if you look out at the world from these lower centers that are more associated with kind of like, you know, our relationship with the world, our stickiness with other people, all that sort of stuff, our, our desire for safety, security, um, you know, kind of like our root awareness, right? The lower regions, and the areas, in, the, the functions of those lower areas of the body have a lot more to do with just general physical <laughs> existence, right? And then you look at it from here, they feel quite different. The perspective looks quite different. What if you looked at everything from a perspective that was a bit more or um, rarefied, subtle, refined, and so on? The characteristics of that would start to shift and form. And so then from the back of the heart, that is a way of looking at experience from not just within your own little world that carries all the shit you've accumulated all day and confusion and you know, personal experience, recordings, interpretations, and so on and so forth. That, you know, every time you record an experience emotionally, mentally, physically, and you remember it, you are creating a simulation of something and you're playing, you're remembering it. That isn't actually reality. That's part projection. That's, that's, um, it's an interface. It gives you information about out there, like 50%, but then like the other 50% is like just you and what you bring to the table. And, the percentages could change, of course. It's not fixed. And so <clears throat> looking at it from the back of the heart is a more impersonal way of looking at things, a way of resolving conflicts that perpetuate themselves through just habits. Somebody asked, why is it harder for me to look from perception of the lower part of the body? That's because those lower parts of the body are more dense and perception normally happens from up here. Also bodily self-consciousness and neuroscience, it's been shown that your torso has a big relationship to kind of just, you know, your position in space, just basic awareness. And then your head is kind of a bit more refined in terms of where are other people? Where am I? Where are my ideas? I look here, I look there to find my ideas. If I ask you a question to remember something that happened 17 or 18 years ago, you might have to look over here because you're actually accessing different parts of your brain to do that. You're actually accessing different, um, let's call them uh, reservoirs of consciousness, different functions of consciousness. And when you look lower in your body, those are more dense, more occluded, they're harder to access because they actually want to be unconscious because that's where your survival is. If you actually try to really look at those lower regions and examine them, they will want to hide a lot more than the higher region information is because because the sort of the 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 uh the experience of mind up here is more want to ornate experiences and looking at things from different perspectives right? right but down here it's going to actually want to kind of secure um uh kind of your safety and doesn't want you to question that that's, and that's that's the that's the toughest part because you can become a priest person you can become a uh, someone who loves meditation and is just up here all the time kind of it's, it's kind of exaggerate right you cross your eyes you're looking you're working on your third eye or whatever you know you know your connection to the to other things and you're kind of ignoring this and this is why a lot of times you know um, spiritual interest and even dissociation that comes from spirituality but it can be a form of, uh, of uh, <clears throat> dissociation from the difficulties of managing the lower regions, the frictions that we normally feel from the traumas that we suffer, and all that. So feel free to type in more questions uh, here. Um, I'm kind of, um, I see a few, I think. Great stuff, thanks, no problem. Um, I feel more energy and stress when around the heart and a humming feeling or sound around the pelvis. Yes, it can happen, especially if there is breathing that happens mostly thoracically as opposed to a deep belly. So that means that your nervous system is a bit more um, kind of 
you know, on edge in a sense. So you might have been tuning into kind of the, some of the stress factor that is that is there. So there's various things you can do for that region. You can kind of go and imagine like kind of like almost red heat is being exhaled through your throat. Right? You can yawn on purpose and imagine like that tension is coming out. That'll reduce some of the kind of uh, you know um, jitteriness of that area. The lower regions can feel kind of also more stable, even though they might be more occluded, they feel more stable. I had a moment within that meditation that was like a uh, osmosis. I had like an inner vision of the world within. Great, exactly. So these kinds of awarenesses where you're aware of things and aware of awareness, <laughs> aware of your consciousness, think about, th think about that transformation. If your mind is being uploaded in the singularity or you know in some technology and you're diffusing your awareness everywhere the more aware you are of your consciousness and your experience the more you can manage it the more you can say oh i'm more aware here than i am there so what if i you know if, if, if there's a if there's an experience of transitioning from one uh if you're uploading your mind or something into the cloud you're porting your mind into a virtual body the parts you're less aware of, aware of are likely going to be left behind. And you may, worse off, you may not have no memory of access to the previous part. You may not even know how to access it again. So the more aware you are of the things that uh, make up who you are and make up perception, um, the more likely that your consciousness will coherently make it through a transition technologically, as well as... Um, uh, not only coherently, but if you had to let go of something, you would kind of know how to remove your awareness from those things and let them go and realize what happened, as opposed to going to another realm and not remembering or not being aware of what happened. It's like, oh, I don't know. Something's missing, but I don't know what it is. Yeah, you don't know what it is because you didn't have awareness in that thing that was lost, that aggregate, that component. That, that sort of node of your mind or consciousness. So I think you start to see the picture here. Uh, is there something like being hyper aware? Um, yes, there is. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, you can create like a super um, surveillance system to be aware as, of more things all the time. Um, and that is not a uh, something about becoming paranoid, right? If, if you have a tendency towards paranoia and you start applying this, you're actually, well, you're actually distorting your, the benefit you can get out of it. You're kind of distorting the ultimate gains and you're sort of, um, kind of, you're, you're, you're kind of, the paranoia is based on fear, right? So that's a lower region issue that's not being resolved as you cultivate the higher regions. That's why ascension is spirituality, um, uh, you know, constantly, constantly, you know, going up and only being aware of these upper regions and colors and things like that is only going to go so far. It could actually stop you from focusing on resolving other things. Uh, take DMT and skip the meditation part. I wouldn't take it, but it would be interested with someone who concerns himself with spirituality, awareness, consciousness, thinks about some such, such substances. Yes. Well, personally for me, that was a big part of, of my journey. It kind of, you know, I, I studied the brain in a lab because of a lot of the experience I had had. Some of those were endogenous, you know, natural, just occurring, you know, meta awareness is occurring in different ways. Others were through psychedelic, you know, things. Um, you know, I have to say, you know, psychedelics are a complex topic. They're not that straightforward. Um, uh, a lot of people that do ayahuasca and DMT actually blow holes in their awareness and they become more susceptible to in negative external influences afterwards. You have to have the um hopefully be ideally before you do those experiences you have the the wherewithal to manage them the awareness that's already there so you know what you're going through the um uh otherwise you can do it afterwards i know that after one of my first psychedelic experiences i entered a kind of depression for a while and uh, i didn't expect that it has to do with the idea of extending your perception of reality to this very sublime place and then coming down and realizing I got to deal with the world and I don't want to deal with the world, you know, and, and, and as it is. So be careful what you just jump into uh, meditation and self cultivation. I call this cultivation is are not the same thing. Uh, they can support each other. Having said, uh, you know, 
the insights you get from psychedelics are tiny, tiny, <laughs> compared to what you do when you self-cultivate uh, with, with a good set of tools. It's tiny. And you know, you can go up, you're, a, you're kind of transforming, oh, psychedelic, you get distracted. You go through, oh, I want to do the more powerful psychedelic. I want to do ketamine, I want to do ibogaine, I want to do DMT. You know what? All those things will give you unique experiences. And then the big question is, the big burden is on you, my friend, is how you're integrating them. Are you integrating them? There's a lot of risk involved. By all means, if you're going to do it, enjoy and do it safely, the right set and setting. Having said that, um, there are much greater tools available. I guarantee you. Not just my opinion. Um, <clears throat> that happened to me after Burning Man. Yeah, that happens. Um, book recommendations on non-duality, contemplation, self-inquiry. Yep, I can uh, I can recommend. Um, I, there are many recommendations I can make. I can say um, check out the works of John Jones. It's quite good perspectives on the world and fear. Someone asked about fear, how to address fear. Um, there's a book by John Jones, uh, you know, A World Without Fear, I forget it. I can't remember that's the name, exact name of the book. He has a couple other books. Um, I would also recommend the works of Dr. Glenn Morris for actual energy cultivation in a much more kind of a multivalent way, let's say. Um, and Dr. Glenn Morris is the person who developed The Secret Smile, which we did earlier, very early on, where, you know, he discusses how to do this stuff with a partner. Um, discusses how to travel in the void, how to do the, you know, the pre-dream work, how to um, uh, travel in the void, I said that already, and non-dual awareness. All that stuff is in that curriculum. The links are below in the description of this video. Um, what natural set of tools would you recommend? Those, the ones I just mentioned. Um, I would suggest working with breath awareness and emotion cultivation. Um, and attention and intention in certain ways to maximize your chances of success. You can go do meditation for ages. You could do just qigong for ages. You can do yoga asana or yoga movement for ages, and that will get you, will prime you. Those individual things will get you a certain, uh, a certain um, distance, so to speak, and they'll prime you. But you want synergistic practices, and even Ben Gertzel. CEO of Singularity Net, uh, if you've read his books, uh, talks a lot about cognitive synergy, open cog, the, 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 you know, the kind of the underlying <laughs> engine of, of, uh, of, uh, of Singularity Net um, is based on cognitive synergy, synergizing different capacities. You want a system that allows you to synergize those. Um, and that's what's worked the best for me. And that's what I share now. Right? Um, <clears throat> How do you separate the scientific language from the artistic, or rather see the unity and explain these concepts to people that are more susceptible to one or the other? Ooh, great question. Well, you know, for me, I was, you know, I'm a musician and I'm also a scientist, right? So I have my PhD and I have um, my musician, uh, you know, compositions and stuff. And I do, I do each one well when I'm kind of focused on that one, but there's also something that happens when I synergize between the two. The creativity from my sort of, let's call it the right brain, you know, which is not kind of a myth, a left brain, right brain thing, but, but we know what we mean when we talk about it. So let's, let's use that analogy. Um, if I use kind of the more creative brain, let's say, aspect, and I infuse my science with that, I'll come up with ideas, hypotheses, like left and right, you know? Um, and if I apply my, my more scientific aspect to my music, I might come up with some interesting rhythms and, and time signatures and ideas, and there's an alchemy that occurs between those. So appreciating both, I think, is, 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 is useful in seeing the other for what it is. Um, I'm interested in creating a Rosetta Stone between the ineffable Right, these the, the experience, the first person experience, and the technical, scientific. As Galileo said, you know, measure what can be measured and what is. In, I forgot the exact quote, but make immeasurable, make measurable what is immeasurable. Um, to that extent, to paraphrase uh, terribly. Um, so these things that are not measurable, if they could be measured, they could be more accessible to more people potentially to understand how it works. So. 
when I'm speaking with scientists, I speak more scientifically. When I'm speaking with the artists and the creatives, the people that aren't scientists, I speak more artistically and more from that kind of intuitive kind of, you know, al alchemy sort of perspective. Um, I think the unity of both is goes a lot further. Um, explaining the concepts, I think there are ways to explain it. Explain these, ex I can explain non-ordinary consciousness as I have today to some extent from the perspective of physiology and biology. And I think you can get quite some very, very advanced development of your fundamentals just by looking at it biologically, just by looking at it in terms of breath, biology, getting the right techniques together, focusing your attention on certain parts of your body like we did today in our meditation. Just talking about it in that language. Ultimately, these language languages create belief systems and belief systems are not the most optimal way of, of, of looking at reality. Um, they're just belief systems. So science is very beneficial for helping us collectively get together, right, and understanding things from a common ground and making changes to public health and to government, you know, based on evidence, because it's such a big world, you know. We can't just willy-nilly say things, and someone might have experiences that somebody else isn't having, and, you know, so science is important. Science is important. Um, and we want to make these things that aren't yet scientifically understood due to lack of funding, due to lack of, you know, interest, recognition, awareness of these things, appreciation of these things. We want to get those things to be more measurable. Until that point, though, we must cultivate them because that's what's going to make us not be fooled when an AI comes saying, well, I'm intelligent, I'm human. And we're like, oh, my God, you're so shiny and metallic and you're beautiful. And like, well, can you understand you know, do you understand consciousness in a deep way? Do you, are you having experience? I think the Turing, the bar for the Turing test is much higher the more you cultivate because you'll always ask, oh, can can an AI perceive what I'm perceiving through non-ordinary consciousness? Can it have the imagination I have? And so, you know, these are these are these are these are kind of questions that hopefully Singularity Net is going to play a big part in asking uh, in answering as well as decentralized finance as we start to kind of uh, <laughs> turn everything into reward for everyone, you know, monetize everything. What happens, what needs to happen for this field um, to get more attention? Hmm. Well, in my last talk, I give the, the kind of the, 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 the foundation for, for giving importance to these things which is basically, hey, we're replicating ourselves, and we're replicating ourselves not according to our highest capabilities, but to just kind of an average level, and we have a limited time window because AI is being constructed that'll take more and more place in our lives, more and more, it'll occupy more attention from us, and our kids will be born with AIs and robots that are may not be feeding them the best vision, the best version of themselves, right? It'll be like a little loop, and the, the human will end up not being as smart as it could be because the AI dumbed it down. So for us to get out of this, we need to first realize that AI and the, the future of AI is fundamentally a, a matter of human intelligence. And then having the right conversations with the engineers, engineering those insights, finding ways to translate them. I have a very rudimentary kind of framework for it that we can talk about it in a future talk. Um, and, and it's meant to stimulate conversations with engineers um, and, and uh, you know, blockchain developers and so on to create, um, you know, a uh, decentralized autonomous consciousness or mind and so on, which is something that that is uh, in the works. If it's something you want to be involved in, please uh, write to me and let me know what it is that you do and what it is that you, um, what it is that you want and, 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 you know, what it is that you want to see in the world um, and, and, and we'll kind of take it from there. Um, so to get more attention, it needs to be appreciated. People need to cultivate the attention and to understand from the talk I gave last time that it's actually imperative that we do so, that AI increases capabilities. And for AI to do so, we can't just go on simulating everything through machine learning. We have to actually have AI, we have to, we have to be inspired to create the right architectures. And to, do, to be inspired as such, we need to appreciate the mind in that way. The reason Ben Gertzel is, 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 is where he is, aside from his 
brilliant intellect is also because he appreciates consciousness in a very far-ranging way. He appreciates Taoist models of, of, of uh, human morphology, consciousness, traditional Chinese medicine. Um, he's able to kind of see these things and appreciate that. And, and so when you ask, you, know, you ask, if you're here on this channel, you've probably either heard of my work or Ben Gertzel's work or Singularity Net's work in general or Sophia, the robot. Um, this isn't for granted. This is not just something we're stumbling upon. Oh yeah, AI could have some cool consciousness up in there. <laughs> okay, let's move on. No, this is here for a reason. It's important. Um, it's existential, um, actually. So refer to my previous talk to understand why it's existential. Okay, and why there's a natural ethical question that arises from the fact that we are replicating ourselves according to our vision of ourselves, right? Um, <laughs> um, yeah, feel free to ask any more questions. I think the main takeaway from this, from today's talk, is um, at a personal level that we will be able to handle the journey towards singulatar the singulatarian horizon. We'll be able to handle that to the, to the degree that we can open up our horizons of experience. So we can create singularities of experience. Cultivation, self-cultivation of non-ordinary consciousness, of our creativity, of our deep depths of awareness and perspectives, like we just touched upon today, just scratch the surface. Cultivating that breeds singularities of experience and that helps to foster the psychological preparedness for a technological singularity. Now, I just want to say, and I should have said this in the beginning of the talk, um, if you're not, if you're coming here from a non-singulatarian perspective, it's the singularity and that whole idea, you can, you don't have to look at it as an ideology or as a dogmatic idea. It's simply an acknowledgement of our increasing uh, co-penetration with technology. And many singularities have happened in the past in, in consciousness, you know, multi, the origin, uh, the, the birth of multicellular organisms for the first time, you know. The Cambrian explosion. Those are many singularities of space, time, and information, evolution, ecology that happened at that point. It didn't involve like metal technology or our, our, our kind of cognitive objective perspective, taking tools and silicon chips and putting it together. Um, that's just a human thing. But this has happened before in other species, just through evolution. And and those imagine imagine uh, uh, when when a, a prokaryote was subsumed into a larger body to become a eukaryote, that was a singularity for the prokaryote cell. The mitochondria being incorporated in the cell, that was a singularity event for the mitochondria. And that mitochondria's mind was blown, but it no longer functions for itself only. It functions for the cell, right? And I'm sure there were many little crappy versions of mitochondria that did not make it <laughs> because it didn't have the right genetic profile, the right, you know, RNA, et cetera, expressions, the right proteins and so on to actually be able to integrate. I'm sure that integration tried to happen many times before it actually worked. For us, it's not so much a biological consistency that, that needs to be there for that merger to happen. It needs to be a more conscious one. That's why we're arguing here. You know, maybe me talking about all this is, is like years ahead of, when it's going to actually become important and that's fine you know this is the early conversation uh, and, and i'm sure i'm not the first one to talk about this you know in, in some rudimentary form um it's just my background in neuroscience my background in experiences and various so sorting through all the bs of the spiritual world including cults and all that stuff and, you know um i think that that i i kind of have a different a unique vision of it based on my own biography you know so uh, I got so much out of this. Great. I look forward to reading the books you recommended. I offer non-dual coaching. Makes it always looking for new material, which makes these concepts accessible to people. Yes. Awesome. Excellent. Um, how close are we to the singularity? Um, yeah, I think it's a, I think we're already in it. And I think we are, uh, parts of our body have been in other singularities and, you know, if you're having singularities of experience, you're already having singularities with uh, other modes of consciousness. Uh, that's technological singularity. We've already, we're already well into it. Our phones, we're, we're cyborgs already. It happens very subtly. <laughs> it can catch you, you know. Um, uh, what cultural difference? Okay, the merger of it with AI also means unification.
education. Yes, it's a form of yoga. Um, is is a single sentient being more desirable than the variety of billions of sentient beings? Uh, no, uh, the variety is important for an AGI to develop its 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 vista, its view, and its incorporation of to develop develop oracular intelligence. And needs we need the variety there. We need the variety there. AGI is going to be the first massive technological and evolutionary advancement. Do you agree? And how far out do you predict we are? Um, the seeds of AGI are already here. Like we're already preschooling AI. We're, are, we can arrive at AGI through a bunch of narrow AIs fusing together, putting them together. Hopefully, it's done in a beneficial and mostly decentralized way. Not through centralized siloing, because then we have our, our our AI overlords aren't actually AI overlords. They are our mega corporation overlords. <laughs> AI is is AGI is a natural part of human evolution. I talked about this in my last talk on causal biomimesis. We are evolved to replicate ourselves not only reproductively, biologically, but through our neocortex. The fact that we have objective thought is already going to set in motion a self-replication process. Objectivity is basically an attempt to take an internal psyche soup of understanding and, and processes and it project them externally into duality and recreate them. So, you know, to learn about ourselves, we build outside. So all this stuff is in the making. We just need to make sure it's made with the right intentions. Um, will we melt inside a single mind and lose our individuality? Possibly. Possibly. There's a paper I wrote with Ben, Ben Gertzel, um, called Mindplexes, and that is going to be the subject of a future talk in the series, Mindplexes, which basically a Mindplex is a the fusion of a human mind with an AI or AGI mind, and how that looks like, and how we can prepare for that, how that, uh, and, I, and I analyze that actually from a pretty cognitive neuroscience perspective, not, not just uh, looking at it from, you know, <laughs> you know, um, from you know this non-ordinary perspective, um, I know there was something else I was going to say. Um, can't quite remember about your question about the losing our individuality. A great, it's a great question also of the fact of what is an individual, right? Um, it's important to be able to maintain our self. Awareness, self-sovereignty, you know, to be able to decide non-coercively what's what we do with ourselves. Um, and, and we want to be prepared to transcend our individuality by doing these kinds of practices in a certain way. Is that the case already? We are just not aware of that we are one single mind. Yes, 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 yes. Thank you for stating the thing that I didn't really state in my in, in my talk explicitly, and yet was kind of like one of the underlying kind of messages, which is the singularity, technologically, in its most advanced forms, in which we're fused with this bigger reality, this bigger AGI, you know, omniscient AGI, you know, ostensibly, is actually a technological replication of of the merger of the microcosm with the macrocosm that a lot of sages and a lot of cultivators have done, and that is the whole reason why you want to prepare yourself for that, not just at the level of non-dual meditation, but embodying that and actually translating that to each nerve plexus and the experience there and letting go of stuff that doesn't believe in, in in that letting go of aggregates in yourself a conscious and unconscious that do not believe that you know there is a fundamental kind of unity with, with things unity does not mean lack of boundaries i should just say there will always be the individual body you got to take care of it you know you're not going to touch the burning stove you're going to burn yourself um you're not going to let someone you know do something to you that's not in the greatest benefit um, so yes, the, techno the technological singularity is a mirror, a reflection of the capacities that are in ourselves that we are unconsciously striving towards. <laughs> I'm already prepared, just waiting for it to happen. Um, I also want to say Oh, can we connect to other people's minds and receive their information? If so, how? Mm -hmm. So that's called psychic, psychical abilities. That's what that's referred to. Um, there's a lot of attention in society on um, psychical abilities being just, can you read what number I'm thinking about right now? 
How many, how many, you know, what number am I thinking about? What am I thinking about right now? It's not like that. There are people that can supposedly uh, claim that they, they claim they can do that. I don't find that that very impressive, uh, whether it's true or not. Um, I, what I'm more interested in is perceiving the subtleties of of my own mind. And what I've noticed is that the more you can subtle perceive the subtleties of consciousness within your own microcosm, your own fractal of awareness, the better you can relate and perceive that in other people. Whether you want to call it mind reading, you know, telepathy, and so on and so forth, is is is, is up for debate. But what I would say is that your degree of empathy increases, and you kind of perceive things at a sublinguistic level and at a translinguistic level. The things that are not being said, the things the the person's vibe becomes much more able to be detected. So, what if we can measure that one day? <laughs> that would be fantastic. To be able to measure that, you kind of need to know where to look. And to know where to look, it's helpful to start cultivating these things. Can people hack our minds? Sure. <laughs> we can. We are subject to external influences all the time. Um, we live in. Uh, we live in the shadow of what is called uh, an egregor. Egregors are basically group and the the, the kind of group psychical mind. Um, if you walk into a certain city and you live in a certain city for a year, you will be influenced by the collective mind. And a lot of it has to do with just basic. Uh, habitus, meaning you walk into a room full of people that are, uh, um, I'm going to borrow my my, uh, my friend's example, you, you walk into a, a room full of ballet dancers that are just stretching and, you know, it could be a kitchen you walk into and they're stretching with their legs on the table and stuff. You will, you When you enter the room, you might naturally become more straight just because you're entering the room, you know. You enter a comedy club, you might start, you might be more ready to laugh more, who knows, you know. It's, it's it, unconscious influences are always at play. So our minds are constantly being hacked in, in, in a way, you know, the idea is do you have the self-awareness to know, notice when that happens and to prevent negative external influences from, from taking over. For that, you need to know the bounds of your awareness, where the leaky por porous places are, avoid situations and things that leak. Um, avoid authoritarian spirituality, very important. Uh, don't always believe what you hear. Try different things. Keep an open mind. Ask yourself and your gut and your heart, does this feel right to me? More questions. The collective mind is the egregor, E-G-R-E-G-O-R-E. -E. The collective mind is an egregor. Yes, it's like a, a, an egregor is a cultural mandala that basically uh, influences things. So you look at these old Buddhist tankas, these old paintings where you see like a Buddha in the middle and then you see these little floating gods and goddesses around them. They were great at portraying those things. We don't really have those uh, that many today. Um, but, you know, <laughs> if we had one of the world to, to, to today, you know, you, you, you could just draw various historical things, you know, technology, the, the U.S. dollar, the petrodollar, the world economy, capitalism, all those kinds of things. In our, our influence the egregors that we normally um, that we bathe in, and that influences our thoughts. When I lived in Hong Kong, uh, I could feel that the group egregor in Asian peoples is much more collectively minded, um, and people are ready to kind of take care of the pandemic together and do it all together. Whereas in the U.S., uh, there in the Western societies, especially the U.S., there is such a there is such a um, an emphasis on personal freedom that you kind of actually sabotage the greater whole. Imagine if like one of your organs decided to say, screw this body, I don't give a shit. I'm going to rebel. I'm going to stop operating. Your whole body dies because now your liver doesn't work anymore. How about that? You know, so, so, so it, the individualism of, of American society is really great for like ingenuity, like oh, version 1.0 of something. Um, the kind of collectivism of other societies um, that are older, much wiser in their, um, not necessarily better, right? It's not good, bad, better, or worse. It's just about um, you have deeper historical awareness of your culture, and you, 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 you kind of take one, you do it for the team, so to speak, that has its benefits. You know, it's, 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 and it's not all black or white. You know, so this is what I want to say earlier about centralized consciousness and decentralized consciousness. Decentralized consciousness, so I, I, I talked about this in a Twitter thread. You can look at my Twitter, at Gabriel Axel, G-A-B-R-E-L-A-X-E-L. 
A-X-E-L, A-X-E-L. There's a recent tweet where I mentioned something about um, that we are all flat earthers, but the people that believe the, the earth is actually flat are just a special type of flat earthers. Flat earthers basically means you take a sphere or a circle, the reality, which is nonlinear and infinite in a way. The, the ratio that defines sphericality and circularity is pi, 3.14, ad infinitum, it never ends. So there's actually no definition to roundness. So roundness is in a way a concept of gazing into infinity and contemplating non-linearity of everything. So flatter, uh, being a mental flat earther, which is what I think most people tend to be, is in a sense we all are that way, or different parts of us are that way. We're all working together to you know help each other you know improve the situation. So being a mental flat earther is like taking the round sphere and creating a tangent based upon it. So if I take this and I go on a tangent, that tangent is my worldview. And I'm creating an extrapolation of my worldview. And I'm applying it to other things when it doesn't pertain at all. Right? My worldview based upon my point that I decided to take a tangent on and applying it to everything else does not acknowledge the, the infinitude, the multiplicity, the multivalence, the polyvalence, the the, the the beautiful multiplicity of the world. So a centralized consciousness would take tangents and kind of just kind of like constantly um, uh, uh, extrapolate its own perceptions and apply it to everything else. And <clears throat> that's very, let's call it egocentric. And I don't mean the, the person doing it is egotistic. I just mean it's, it's 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 a it's a it's a perspective that's central to the human ego personality, you know, the individual. Now, what would it be like to decentralize consciousness? What's decentralizing consciousness means, really, at a, at a deep level? Well, it means that you're number one at a basic level, able to take other perspectives. You could argue that one of the big things we suffer from in the world is a lack of ability to take perspectives, right? If we could take perspectives from all over the world, we would transcend so many limitations, beliefs, egregores, and so on, you know, just by taking perspectives. We might default to a, to a central perspective when we're at home, you know, taking care of our family and so on. Um, that said, you can learn to operate multiple things at the same, multiple spheres of awareness at the same time. And that comes much more easily when you're actually doing self-cultivation practices, right? You, you do the things we talked about earlier in this video, different practices, you know, you systematize synergy of practices, kind of like what I teach in my courses, for example, those kinds of things, um, and, and, they're, and you can get them from any other sources. It's about, it's about what integrates synergy. And and you could take those and it becomes much easier to take to hold various perspectives at the same time. Meaning I can sit right here with my awareness, value the benefits of decentralized society, decentralized democracy, and and kind of indivi the individual ingenuity I was talking about earlier, I could value that. And in the same awareness, I can have another layer that really understands the benefits of collective cohesion. And I don't have to adopt the worldview of an entire nation or the way they do things. I just take a taste of it. I sample and I ask, how can that be translated to our culture in a way that makes sense? Or how can I transcend all of that? So decentralizing consciousness is number one about, about taking other people's and other things' perspectives. Number two, it's about not jumping around between perspectives only. It's also about becoming more a perspective, a perspectable, meaning you don't have a perspective. Right. Um, this takes more time and more practice. Reference the tweet that I that I mentioned and it was linked for a very, very simple explanation of what that is. Um, but what happens is you start to kind of view, imagine like instead of jumping from here on the earth to another point in the earth to take the perspective of another nation, you actually take the perspective of the center of the earth and you're looking out at the earth as a whole and you're feeling it as a whole. Now that doesn't mean that all you care about now all of a sudden is nature and eating fruits and living in the wild. That's not what I mean. 
It's not about Gaia only, Gaian consciousness. It's about appreciating the complexity of human organization and the complexity of information from an aperspectival position, so to speak, and becoming more and more and more non-local, okay? So I'll pause here and take some questions. All the self, yes, I see you studied in Utrecht. Uh, Harlem in the, yeah, exactly, I studied in Utrecht. Uh, alles goed. Um, <clears throat> um, uh, Group think is inferior state of existence than self sovereignty. Well, <laughs> um, group think inherently has a negative connotation. I understand what you mean, group think, but the collective mind is not the same as group think. It's not the same thing. And being sovereign kind of has a tendency of, of uh, these days to mean, you know, I'm separate from everything else. You know, there's actually quite a connection of. of Sovereign, the idea of being a sovereign self to be a nationalist um, is quite popular, actually, in Germany in the 1930s. So, <laughs> um, not to go down that that direction, let's say, uh, for now, that there are benefits to both, and and in a, in a sense, you can have both. Um, uh, you can. It depends on where you're planted, where the tree is growing first. <laughs> are you growing in a society that's collectively minded first? Are you growing in a society that's more individually minded first? Um, for the singularity, you probably want to appreciate the collective mind. Uh, definitely. We already, as someone just said, collective unconscious. We already are connected to the collective unconscious. People that are really, mm, my individuality, mm, my, my self-sovereignty, um, too much, uh, distort, actually become more mired in their, in their limited kind of the limitations of their ego personality. And it doesn't, that's not gonna benefit uh, anything related to the singularity, I, I can guarantee you. Um, and none of this is good or bad. It is just simply, we're, we're making observations about what is going to most optimally get us to a more beneficial state, a more beneficial, uh, uh, develop a more beneficial situation for society and, cult and as a whole humanity consciousness the cosmos even <laughs> so and i mentioned this in my last video um we want to do all of this from a perspective of altruistic intent yeah you build altruistic intent on top of healthy sense of your own personal boundaries and so on and so forth your own self sovereignty in a healthy way Right, not separateness, but just confidence, ownership of yourself, awareness, knowing where your boundaries are, um, for health to make you a more healthy participant in the whole. And then from there, altruistic intent. Right, we want the greatest good for the greatest number of people, and you can really do some good to you know see the the bigger picture by doing some of the things we did earlier, looking from the back of the heart, so on and so forth taking the bigger perspective, letting go of, uh, of um, you know, our unconscious notions, our, our tr tr crystallized emotions and trauma and so on and so forth. Um, the intention is the issue. Yeah, the intention is the core of a lot of things, actually. Yes, it's, it's, uh, we'll talk about that in one of the next talks about how intention, even unconscious intention, really, um, uh, in a way, determines attention and how experience goes um can self so so can self-sovereignty be implemented with singularity centralization and ai yes it depends on the connotation of self-sovereignty if you mean sovereignty like nobody enters my castle my moat my rights me 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 no that's kind of like a a, a very crude version of sovereignty and it's most it's the way most people use sovereignty now it's, it's kind of it's kind of doing a disservice to the power of the word. So, so that won't survive the singularity at all. And the decentralization. You can, however, have self-sovereignty, meaning you are aware of what makes up in the individual. You can be aware of the influences of ex the external world on your personal field, which neuroscience has shown there's a personal field, like it or not. It's more like a cell wall that allows things in and out. It's not a hard wall. 
right? So you don't want to pretend you have a hard wall. You don't, <laughs> you know, forget about it. You have a soft permeable wall and you want to be aware of what comes in and out. You know, you know, it's like, it's like a firewall and a, and a, you know, a VPN, you know, you want to know what's coming in and out. You want to allow the things that are beneficial, the things that are not, you kind of leave them out. So someone said auric field. Yeah. Auric field is, is a, the way people have called the, the, the peripersonal space, which begins with your center of your body and ends at the end of your middle finger. When you stick it out in front of you, anything beyond that is outside your peripersonal space and gets processed differently in the brain. That's in many scientific papers, including in nature and neuron, which are the highest impact nature uh, publications in science. So uh, they don't refer to it as the aura because <laughs> we're talking, speaking different languages there. Um, having said that they have a nice rigorous definition and that's, that's all covered in my PhD thesis. Um, so the self sovereignty can be maintained, meaning, you, you know, you, you, you are, you are, <clears throat> you are engaging in, in, in a, in a fair system of, of a consensual voluntary exchange. Now, to some degree, you'll be, you will be sublimating yourself into the whole. When you go in, when you go into an airport, you are always sublimating yourself into the bureaucracy of an airport. There's nothing you can do. You cannot just go straight to the plane unless you're living in the 1960s or the 70s. Um, we live in a world where we sublimate ourselves to airport bureaucracy. If in the singularity, you will not be in full control of the things you're interacting with. You know, you, you can you can choose the right ecosystems and sub ecosystems. Um, and therefore exercise more of your, 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 your kind of personal choice. Um, having said that to some degree, you will be sublimating yourself to the whole and part, part of these practices allow you to be more aware of, you know, of what's yours and what's not yours energetically, you know, perceptually, emotionally, physically, mentally, um, uh, and, and, and able to detect breaches of the boundary and you can make those choices as you wish. Um, it seems, uh, our artificial singularity consciousness, allowing that into the natural, real singularity consciousness that already exists will conflict. Very interesting. Okay. Um, the singularity is in a sense, a, uh, um, the technological singularity is an external collective representation of an intuition we already have, which is we can have singularities of experience. Um, the singularities of experience are, in a sense, can get us to these really amazing places. Arguably, a technological singularity, if, big, big um, footnote or asterisk, uh, fine print, if the technological singularity incorporates these farther reaches of human nature, these subtle aspects of consciousness that we've been talking about here today, if the singularity includes those, this, the technological singularity includes those things, it's less likely to conflict, number one. Number two, or, you know, as a part of that, um, the, the less it incorporates those things, it will, it will probably conflict. But if you haven't cultivated those higher consciousness things, you won't even recognize it, right? That's the danger. That's the part of the talk from last time in the series, the, the evolutionary origin of the singularity that you won't, you may not notice, you may not notice that that's happening. So the more you cultivate, the more aware you are. Okay. So you want to, you want to cultivate and be aware so that there's less friction. Um, second thing I was going to say is that <clears throat> the technological singularity potentially has, um, will have the ability to take us even further than individual singular that, that uh, singularities of experience uh can have i think that's further away right much further away than just the beginnings of the technological singularity um and it's a, and i think you want to be careful who you know what singularity you're taking on do you want to take on google singularity do you want to take on uh, microsoft singularity facebook singularity uh, i don't think so um you just be careful. That's why an obsession also with the singularity, whichever one comes first, that's the one I want. <laughs> that's that. That's like a, you're just gonna you're walking into onto a landmine. Be be careful. Be, be careful what you wish for. It's all about how it's done, and how and how you prepare yourself. Um, 
For those who wish to upload their consciousness to an artificial body, uh, what precautions can be taken with the potential of solar flares and su solar superstorms? Ah, you know, um, I don't think we can answer those questions yet. Um, I think, I think that hopefully we won't be uploading our minds or choosing to upload our minds until the technology is uh, sufficiently ready. And also, it's very unlikely we're going to upload our minds in full. In the beginning, it's probably just going to be like little virtual, like kind of like when you put on a virtual reality headset, you have an experience and then you take it off. You know, um, I think in the beginning it's going to be like that. You have experiences, uh, and you have mer mini mergers, mini fusions but you don't go all the way. Hopefully we'll be very well prepared before we go all the way. The technology as well as our consciousness. So <clears throat> I think we should wrap up and very soon. Uh, we're almost at two hours. It's been a fun two hours, I have to say, um, with all these questions and the topic. So any last questions, feel free. And I'm gonna start closing this off. Um, hopefully I've conveyed that that all this can be done in a non-new age way by just looking at the physics of things. Um, your experience is a virtual reality readout of your underlying hardware. Your underlying hardware includes your body, your brain. It's also things that we haven't yet measured scientifically. You know, the, the fields around the body. Um, well, we started to measure them, but you know, uh, really taking it very seriously and kind of, kind of incorporating them in, in our scientific models of self. Um, <clears throat> so hopefully it's understood that you, don't need, you can approach all this non-ordinary conscious stuff in a secular way. You don't need to join a cult. You don't need to wear white. You don't need to um, go off into the Himalayas to do this stuff. Although sometimes making little boy, little little pilgrimages to certain places gives you a nice experience. Um, uh, there are a lot of teachers that um, are also. Um, that are focusing on their little realization of their third eye and uh, they're actually just projecting narcissism. So um, what happens with a lot of teachers and a lot of people that realize things in the higher realms in their mind only, but don't integrate their kind of heart, their connection, their kind of lower centers is that then they, them and their students are all subject to the whims of their lower centers and their lower gut desires and, and impulses and whims. Uh, Learn to recognize that. Um, if you don't know how to recognize that, uh, tell me, and um, we can have another talk on that. Uh, <clears throat> you should subscribe to my YouTube channel if you want to hear more of this kind of stuff. I don't have that many videos because I focus more on very specific instruction for certain things, and, and then I, I enjoy living many aspects of life, uh, and music, and all this sort of stuff. So I. I don't do just a lot of live streams currently. Having said that, if there is sufficient demand, I'm very happy to do more, uh, either on my solo channel and or in conjunction with Singularity Net. Um, very happy to have shared. Um, how could we control those lower center desires? Yep, it's important to, um, to understand the uh, the things that come from there. And we did a meditation earlier, if you saw, um, that we were viewing from the perspective down there. Those are the most unconscious parts. You need to bring awareness there. Um, take a look at my website. The link's below the, the video right now, like the, the integration work, neurophysiological integration, learning, etc. You can take a look at all that um, and, and, and have a sense of what we're talking about here. So, yes, uh, what's my name? My is Gabriel Axel. <laughs> Gabriel Axel Montez is my full name. Um, glad you like it. Glad you like the content. I'm really glad. Um, very glad you like the, the content. I'm glad it's been useful. Um, it's look, I'm very happy to always share these things, you know, because because I, I tend to I've gone through my experiences and I just enjoy I enjoy life, I enjoy the gift, the sort of heaven that is on earth, so to speak. I I, I treat um reality here on earth as 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 it is the it is the virtual reality that we're in search of is kind of a similarity in a way so i enjoy that and then i enjoy making having these conversations with you um and and also working on the underlying principles to help translate this stuff to technology so we can we can you know extend this stuff to other future generations so um 
I wish you all the best and stay tuned for next time. We will do more talks in this decentralized consciousness series. Um, check out the tweet that was referenced. Check out the more information if you want to know kind of a bit more of what's, what's going on, on on my side of the of things from the self cultivation perspective. Um, I'm happy to be in touch with you. So thank you, Singularity Net, for. for uh, and we'll be in touch next time. Someone at Telegram, actually, you have a Telegram group that I use too much. Uh, I'd be happy to share that. Um, I'll have it put in the description later. And then next time, we'll talk about it. So, thank you, everybody. Take care.